Shall we start or can everyone hear me? Okay. I'm advised to start this meeting in English, but um, before moving to that, I would like to give a big merhaba, hoş geldiniz, and then uh, skip to English if possible for everyone. Uh, this is Burcu Nuar here, and I would like to thank Ankon for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to meet all of you and uh, share my point of view in this uh, subject. As far as I know, this is the 26th time that Ancom Plus is uh, bringing people like you are together, which I believe is an amazing thing during the COVID times because, you know, it hit so suddenly and then we didn't know what to do. And I think it's a wonderful way of uh, using the time in a fruitful way way. Today I'm one of the uh, speakers and uh, it will start with me, but we have another uh, speaker, uh, Ms. Karin Merle will be with us shortly. Since she's having another meeting with uh, African Development Bank, she'll uh, come a bit late, like five to ten minutes. That will give me the uh, pleasure of being the first to start speaking and uh, say hi to all of you. And then I'll try to give you a presentation. I'm an economist, uh, just to repeat, my name is Burcu Nuar, and I work for Türkiye Sınay Kalkınma Bankası, Industrial Development Bank of Turkey. That development part is, I believe, very important. And I'll try to uh, show during my presentation that uh, a development bank has some distinguishing features from any other uh, bank. We try to prioritize the things we believe will contribute to the development of our society that we're a part of. Uh, but since I'm an economist, uh, you know, got dirty with the profession itself, I'll try to give my point of view in terms of climate, in terms of European Green Deal, in terms of uh, circular economy. But as I said before, due to my education and my profession, my point of view will always be the economy. And then I'll try to put these things around my profession and I'll be happy to uh, take your questions. I'll try to share my screen. Uh, let's see if I can succeed. Is there something on the screen? Am I lucky enough to show something? Yes. Okay, a thumb up with me, yes. Okay, perfect. I'd like to speak about green recovery in the post-COVID-19 world. Um, that's, a new that's not a new phrase perhaps for some of you, but uh, I should admit that we started to give more midnight oil, thinking about the green recovery. Um, before, in almost every crisis, we focused on only on the recovery. This time we call it green recovery, but there is nothing certain on the paper yet. So it depends on us to make it a recovery and to make that recovery green. So the future is not written yet. It will depend on our actions today. Well, in during my um, conversation with you, I'll try to give a green introduction from the point of an economist. I'll try to give a quick glance at the global economy, and then I'll tell you the green recovery. For me, some, some uh, pit stops are important uh, in green recovery, and those are European Green Deal and obviously the circular economy. Well, this is a story in which some graphs go up. Well, some graphs go down. That's uh, what my business is all about. You know, some go up, some go down. We, we, we try to stay tuned with them. This, I believe, is a graph that you're very, very familiar with. And you can see that this is the carbon dioxide level. And you can see that for many, many years, it was uh, underneath a certain level. But in the recent decades, in the recent six, seven decades, it posted a jump. Clearly, it's about how we consume, how we produce. And how we consume and how we produce are about our decisions in the industry, are about our decisions in the 
economy. So this picture is in fact result of something, but we believe that at this current level, it has to trigger some other reforms in the economy because it has to change because it's not sustainable like this. It cannot go forever like this. This starts from um, you know quite a while ago before Christ. So um, I wanted to show the very latest version of it starting from 1960s. It's uh, almost a linear upward trend, something very difficult to find in my profession. We usually work with cycles. So it's an upward trend. This I find extremely important because some people say that it's only about the growth of the world that emissions are rising in the world. It's not only the growth. If it were the growth, then we would have been following a similar cycle. When the growth comes down, we would see a function of it being reflected in this graph. But it's not really like that. So um, just to, I would like to repeat this a few times during this presentation. It's not only the growth. It's actually how we produce, how we grow. So once we're talking about climate, bringing our planet Earth in a safer situation, I believe we should not be enemies of growth. We should be the enemies of growth that pollute the world. So it's unresponsible acts, I should say. That's why I believe green recovery is an important phrase because I'll show you in the next part of the presentation, we need jobs in this world. We need the economy to recover. Uh, during the COVID times, especially uh, around May, June, there were a lot of news pieces showing how carbon emissions came down, but that was also the times where the industrial production came down. And I'm not sure that's what we want. We don't want the carbon emissions to come down just because we locked down the factories. I think we want the production to continue. Meanwhile, we want to have a clean atmosphere, uh, a clean world. So if these are not mutually exclusive. We can produce, we can create welfare, and we can still help the planet Earth, and we can still distribute the surplus in a responsible way. And then the there comes the famous song, you may say I'm a dreamer, you know, but <laughs> we have to dream about it to find ways to uh, make it come true. Well, sometimes I get this question, you're an economist, why are you talking about climate? Well, I have to because it's in everything that I'm dealing with. Investment, for example, I, I divided this um, into two, fiscal aspects and monetary aspects. Uh, it's uh, from a chapter of a book that I wrote uh, for Elsevier, Handbook of uh, Green Economics, and I'll show it uh, later. But I believe this is a pr pretty fair summary of why every citizen, but also the economist, should be interested in the climate policies. Um, on the fiscal front, it certainly affects your budget, the budget of a government. And the budget of a government means taxes. I'm the one to be taxed. It affects the investment needs. It affects the health expenditures. It affects the private sector's decisions. But it also affects the monetary front. For example, risks to price stability, inflation, you can call it, is uh, very closely related with the uh, climate uh, picture. It affects the capital flows to the countries and um, it affects uh, the global growth picture as well as the micro growth picture of a single country. And uh, something that I find very interesting and I started to work on it actually is green central banking. Um, Bank of England is uh, very famous uh, with this discussion. For example, I'm sure many of you heard about reserve requirements, central banks come up with reserve requirement decisions. Uh, so this green central banking suggests that, for example, if a bank has more green bonds in its portfolio, central bank should give less reserve requirement to those banks. So it's a way of uh, promoting the green financing. Therefore, now 
is a time where we started to think more green in every aspect. And you know about the famous rating notes, S&P, Fitch, Moody's, very popular. They started to give climate rating notes and saying that, are you sure you want to invest in dirty um, players? And when I say dirty, I mean in many aspects. Uh, so I believe uh, every citizen should be interested in the story, but as an economist, we have fair reasons to be interested in climate and we have to be active, not a passive uh, follower of it. We, we have to be very, very active. Just to sum it up now, climate risks are for today. It's not something we're dealing responsibly to leave a good planet to our grandchildren. No, it's for today. And climate risks are for all. I believe there is no privileged uh, group in the society who are uh, risk-free when it comes to climate policies. But microeconomic impacts of the climate crisis should be taken seriously. Please remember to call your friendly neighborhood economist when you're speaking of climate, I would say. It is important. And the global economic outlook in the post-COVID era will definitely affect the decisions to tackle the climate crisis. One question I get quite often is, now that the world economy faced a recession after the global the COVID uh, problem, do you think anyone will be interested in being responsible in terms of climate? Or will they just be interested in recovering the growth, no matter how dirty it is? It's a fair question. Therefore, we have to speak about it now and say that we want recovery, we want our jobs back, but we want this recovery to be green. That's why we have to um, push uh, authorities to take the... And why is that? I would like to give a little bit of a um, background story. Um, that goes back to 2008. Some of you who are interested in economics, financial markets, I'm sure would remember in 2008 uh, with the collapse of the Lehman Brothers and the big housing crisis in the US market, we have one of the biggest crises in the uh, global economy. We call it global financial crisis. This graph, and it's my popular, one of my popular graphs, shows the projections of the IMF World Bank economists as of 2011. 2008 was one of the biggest crises of the global economy. 2009, 2010, we tried to understand what hit us and the central banks cut the interest rates big time. There were big fiscal stimulus. So we thought, okay, we're putting it back to track. And in 2011, the IMF and World Bank said that, take it easy, guys, things are I'm back, do you hear me? Now we hear you, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Isn't it nice to say that the world economy is bad? Am I not allowed or what? Let's go back to sharing that bitter picture. Okay, here it is. Okay. Blue line was what they told would be the case by the time we reached 2016. Flat, I mean, going up, linearly going up, recovery. But the dark line shows what 
was the case as we made it to 2016. Well, said it in a rude way, the failure was big for the IMF World Bank economists. They simply couldn't project the recovery and the recovery was anemic. I always put it in a easier to understand way. On a table surrounded by five people, the world economy could serve food enough for four people. It's not surprising that such a weak recovery brought trade protectionism or people like Trump or Brexit to the world. You know, when you're hungry, you get hostile. So already we had our wounds stemming from the 2008 crisis and then come the COVID. Well, COVID came very harsh on us as of 2020. This graph shows the growth projections of the IMF World Bank friends. I love showing their projections because I can never forecast dollar TL right in my uh, career. So uh, when people blame me, I say, come on, even the IMF guys cannot predict anything right. So uh, it's, it's my way of escape clause, putting an escape clause. This is what the IMF was projecting for 2020. Starting from 2016 and 2019, they said that the growth for 2020 will be somewhere between 3.4 to 3.7. Now they are saying that the global economy will contract by 4.4%. This is harsh. I mean, we're talking about a global economy which could not recover from the global financial crisis of 2008. And on top of it, we get a very sharp contraction. So obviously, poor became poorer. And some of you might come up with the question that, hey, we thought that the uh, stock exchanges in the world, like S&P, like Borsa Istanbul, are going into record high levels. Isn't that the case? That is the case. But asset markets are never for the poor people. And it's never, for, it's never a benchmark for the development. It seems that the world economy needs to improve and create jobs. Having some difficulties changing this, but... Let's see what I can do. Okay. Are we fighting? Yes, we are. In 60% of the world, policy rate is below 1%. In 97% of the advanced economies, policy rate is below 1%. In one-fifth of the world, policy rates are negative. And there has been a fiscal support of $12 trillion to fight the damages of the COVID-19. We need recovery? No. This time, no. We need green recovery. I tried to show until here that we have two big problems. One is the vulnerabilities and the obvious climate crisis. Second is the weakness in the economy. So what we want is to solve both of these problems in a joint strategy. That's why we need a green recovery. There are famous initiatives going on in the world. I mean, United Nations are publishing a lot of things about the global green deal. And International Labour Organization is talking about green jobs very well. And European Commission is also working on the European green deal. Uh, European Union wants to be climate neutral by 2050, which is a very ambitious target. And since uh, European Union is a great trade partner for us, it will have some byproducts for Turkey, the producers and consumers in Turkey as well. But having a green agenda standalone is unfortunately not enough. Uh, I will be sharing some bullets from a recent IMF report called green recovery and they say that well 
Um, this is important, this uh, prolonged recession. Um, but for those, I would like to remind you what I said at the very beginning of this presentation. Uh, do we want the green gas emissions to come down because all the factories are shut down? No, we want factories to continue to work. We want parents to be able to feed their children, um, but we want the green em uh, gas emissions coming down. And indeed, IMF, not that I agree with them very often, but the IMF says that, well, even though the recession continues, the contribution to the greenhouse gas emissions will be limited. So shutting down all the factories is not what we want. Again, what we have been speaking since the beginning of this conversation, decisions taken now will shape the climate for decades. Therefore, it's really the time for us to be active, go into every discussion, tell our views and try to affect people and come together just like we're doing now, uh, because these are the times that the decisions will be taken to affect the climate and the economy for the coming decades. Oops. And therefore, fiscal policy makers should create a green recovery. Well, what can be the public policies? I mean, these are all nice words until now, but what about the policies? What can be the policies? And IMF comes up with some ideas for that. And, well, it says that, okay, guys, climate crisis are around the corner. It's we're not in, um, in the same room with it. But preparedness takes decades in best cases. So we have to do something, but the cost of preparing it is in fact minor compared to the damage that we can be done we can get from that crisis. So let's walk to talk and do some stuff and choose the green way instead of the brown way. And it seems like the public investment projects are the best ways to start. Not that private sector is immune, don't get me wrong, but it's always a good idea to make the um, public sector a pioneer in this story. A climate smart infrastructure is a good idea. Uh, a climate smart infrastructure is something I have some uh, a few words to add, because as I told you, I'm working on a developed development bank and development banks around the world are actually pushing for climate smart infrastructure. They are directing their financing to climate smart infrastructure and there's a big pool of financing there um, waiting to match its right investment strategy. Therefore, um, a climate smart infrastructure can be financed and it can be profitable. Anything responsible doesn't need to bring you loss. That is something I believe we need to tell our friends. Well, technology would be a very important part of it. And um, I, I believe um, that is sometimes missing because it's not easy to say that let's invest in uh, technology. You have to have the uh, human capital for that. So you have to think about your education system for that. And it requires adaptation. Um, now I'm telling what the IMF is telling, but later I'm going to show you a few suggestions made by the TSKB, uh, the bank I'm working for, where we believe that the uh, structural reforms for Turkey lies ahead. And uh, carbon avoid, uh, intensive investments should definitely be avoided. Well, it's easier said than done because the chamber is actually getting narrower and narrower. Uh, world population uh, is going up in a very fast way. Uh, people living in the cities and their percentage to the total population is going up and middle income people will also be uh, an issue to tackle with their welfare. Um, but if these numbers continue like this, and it seems like they will be, we will need 1.5 times of current planet Earth, uh, which is not possible. So it brings us to this famous description of the economics, limited resources, unlimited wants. 
was that. And having said that, I while introducing myself, I forgot to give a brief uh, background. I've been working at the Industrial Bank of Development since 2017, but before I was a lecturer at the Department of Economics at Bilkent University. So uh, this is something I was discussing with my students pretty often. And before that, I was an investment banker for 10 years. So I'll try to combine a few different points of view here as an investment banker, as an academic, and as a development bank. But it all boils down to this same question, limited resources, unlimited ones. Well, there is a challenge to this definition of economics by Kenneth Wolving. He's not from the movie Back to the Future, by the way. It's his original picture. Uh, I know what you're thinking. No, he's, he's not that one. And he says that economics is the study of exchange. That, I believe, is an important definition. We might agree, we might disagree, but it gives food for thought. And I believe when he says is the study of exchange, he wants to remind us that we need to think about reutilizing our resources, which brings us back to circular economy that I would like to discuss. Um, perhaps our, our resources are limited, but perhaps not as limited as we thought they are. That's why we should think about the uh, action plan about a circular economy. This is from uh, European Green Deal. Uh, circular economy is very important uh, part in the European Green Deal. Uh, I believe uh, Ms. Karin will speak more about it. That's why I'm not telling much and I'm not an expert in that, to be honest. But one part of it in this roadmap I find extremely uh, important and I uh, colored it in green actually, make circularity work for people, regions and cities, for people, not only for companies, for people. So this is important, not from a profit view of view only, but from a development point of view that our resources are limited, perhaps not as limited as we thought, or perhaps it's some part it's not as limited as we thought, but we still don't have the access to that due to some frictions in the society. So when we're talking about the circular economy, I see it as a way of expanding our resources, but also expanding the access to these resources. That's why I like the idea here, make circularity work for people. And I believe it's uh, in line with the spirit of the green recovery where we want responsible jobs. So I find uh, circularity is very important for the Turkish economy, but I believe we haven't discussed it enough yet. Uh, so experts like you are um, perhaps should tell us, the economists, how we can embed circularity in our projections for the coming years, coming decades, how we can make this as a very natural part of our growth strategy. And I believe with our questions, because you will tell me, and I won't understand, I can guarantee you, but with my questions, my colleagues with their questions, perhaps we can make the circularity work for everyone and we can embed it in our strategies. That's what we're trying to do. Um, there's something called responsible banking and uh, TSKB is a part of it. I would like to uh, point at this book uh, Handbook of Green Economics. We contributed to this book with a chapter in uh, green finance. And we're trying to point at what a green recovery uh, should look at. Where should green recovery put its feet on? Uh, we believe that gender equality is a big part of it. Um, because we know that uh, women are uh, actually a um, vulnerable part of the society and they are affected uh, more negative than uh, many other parts of the society in, uh, when it comes to climate crisis. We believe that youth unemployment is an issue to be discussed while we are driving towards a green recovery. Uh, and we believe that every sector should be discussed and redesigned again. So perhaps we should not say tourism sector for Turkey, but we should say sustainable tourism for Turkey. Small words, big impacts. Uh, I would just like to recall what the IMF was telling 
decisions taken today will shape tomorrow. So I believe it's time to discuss this. Agriculture and recycling are important uh, issues for us. Um, these pictures are all the reports um, that we published, and you can access them all um, through the webpage of the uh, TSKB. We try to uh, take attention uh, to these subjects, for example, research and development. Uh, what's research and development got to do with climate or the circular economy? Well, I was just trying to point that the need for investing in technology. Uh, so I believe it is important. Uh, so every sector has a role. Um, in the green recovery to make the green recovery possible. And I believe banking sector uh, is also important in this one. These are all just examples we're working on uh, pollution, noise and impact investments. Uh, so um, these are like the pieces of a puzzle that should come together um, to deal. And I would like to introduce um, a publication of us. Uh, hopefully, um, one day we can get your uh, contributions for this publication as well. TSKB is um, issuing a quarterly climate review. Uh, it's a new uh, research note uh, by the Economic Research Department of the TSKB. And there are two things that I would like to take your attention at this um, publication. Well, one of them is the increasing contribution of the development banks to climate finance. We believe this is very important. For example, European Green Deal uh, tells many companies, factories to go circular. And those European factories and companies are looking for ways to extend their supply chain to countries like Turkey to get circular, because we, we are not alone in this game. And uh, therefore it supports the investment need of the country. It brings responsible action to the investment strategy of the country and it requires financing. And there are uh, bodies, development banks working for this. And I believe development banks need to be guided with the civil societies and experts like you are to build the future. And another point that I'd like to take your attention before I conclude is a little note here, Green Swan platform. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Green Swan. Uh, you would remember Black Swan from 2008 crisis, very odd risks. Um, you know, outliers, the, the odds are limited that that risk will materialize, but if they materialize, the damage is big. Green swan is a black swan when it comes to climate. Very odd, very outlier risk in climate, but if it happens, it hurts. Uh, so TSKB set up a platform called Green Swan platform uh, with volunteer contribution from private sector, public, academics, and experts like you are uh, to deliver, uh, to first build strategies and then spread these ideas to uh, build a green recovery together. And I would like to take attention uh, of you guys as important and pioneer experts in the society to this uh, platform. Hopefully we can work together one day. And I'd like to conclude my presentation. Uh, climate crisis cannot be discussed without thinking the economic conditions. And I might be saying that because I'm an economist, but I truly believe in it. Responsible acts should be planned now. Now is the time to be able to reap the fruits in the future. And European Green Deal is an important roadmap. We should not be blind or deaf to European Green Deal and we should hurry up Paris Climate Agreement in uh, European Green Deal should be closed followly, uh, followed closely for the uh, Turkish uh, society, producers and consumers. And I know that uh, there are big initiatives speaking about uh, Paris Agreement especially, um, but I believe it's um, never too late to heat the debate. If the debate was active yesterday or this morning, I would just suggest that let's heat it up now again. It's never, never too late. Uh, and in this re respect, we need to um, burn more midnight oil to think about the circular economy and financing the green economy. Well, but I should say that the Compass 
my last word always is the compass would be unchanged. We should do the right thing for the right reason. I never say that Tur Turkey should go green because it helps to attract more capital, for example. No, we should go green because it's the right thing to do. And because we should insist on the green recovery, we should insist on getting circular. And uh, that can only be done by people from different backgrounds coming together and delivering the back big picture. Well, that's all from me. And this is uh, one of my favorite uh, tunes. The secret of success is to stay cool and calm on top and paddle like hell underneath. <laughs> That's all I uh, suggest to do because when I start speaking about climate, the number of audiences fall for me. If I speak about exchange rates, if I speak about Borsa, more people listen to me. When I speak about climate, it's less. So this is a hilly road, but I believe uh, we need to uh, work on this together. Thank you very much for your patience. And um, I think if everybody is awake still, uh, I should thank. And if uh, Kareen is here, I should pass the ball. Yes. Thank you, Borcho. Great. And um, everyone for attending the webinar. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, for those of you who don't know me yet, um, my name is Karen Merli. I am a green economy specialist um, advising private and public actors on how to transition to a more sustainable economy. And for example, I've supported the Indonesian government in identifying ways how to implement and accelerate um, their sustainable public procurement to create market signals and also to eco-innovate eco the, the society, the market. Um, it, it directly links, links to what Bojo said, like the financing of the circular economy um, and the more sustainable economy is, is key. Um, and um, public procurement can be one important instrument to actually finance um, this transition. Also, I've been working as a circular economy advisor, as well as an advisor on marine and plastics litter for different development financing institutions. Um, today, um, I will cover, sorry, I will cover four aspects of the circular economy transition. Um, we enter with the schools of thought, just briefly. Um, I will make the point that circularity per se is not enough. We need to slow down and shrink as well. And then I will provide two examples, circular business models. And, mm -hmm. and is, is there a comment? Uh, Karin, maybe yes. it, it's better to have your voice a bit louder. It's hard mm -hmm. to hear you. Okay. I, I, and also, maybe you can also, you know, launch your video, maybe just for us to see you. <laughs> yes, the video is today not possible, but um, I would need your advice on how to increase the volume of the of the microphone. No, when you speak louder, it's okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, then I will provide two examples, circular business models, and end with a sustainable consumption instrument, which I just already mentioned. Many governments around the world have uh, started to apply uh, to stimulate markets and transitions, the public procurement instrument, and um, it can be encouraged, uh, it can be used to encourage a transition to a circular economy. So a uh, circular economy is, is, is aiming at imitating nature, who by design, which by design is, is circular and without any waste. So, so there are many mm, schools of thought on which the current uh, interpretation and, and concept um, that most of you might know by now um, is actually built on. So for example, the cradle to cradle that has come up in the 1990s um, 
and which essentially already promoted the same principles of today. Um, and also the performance economy uh, brought forward by Walter Stahl, promoting the decoupling of economic growth, jobs and wealth creation from the actual resource consumption, as well as biomimicry, which is the imitation of nature to achieve regeneration and um, also the most commonly known in recent years especially has been the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's uh, circular economy butterfly in which the circularity um, in a bio biosphere and technosphere circles was promoted in a variety of loops. Um, so the cir circular economy essentially means a shift from a linear economy in which we extract, um, make, use and dispose to a circular economy in which we extract and recycle, make, use, reuse in a perpetual cycle. Both the uh, circular economy butterfly proposed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and this here, this redesigned circle um, uh, illustration adapted by the founders of the cradle to cradle concept. Um, they are based on the idea that um, the, the products and business models should be in it, it should be designed in a way that there's no more waste uh, or no more pollution. So that is the, the overall objective and that products and materials are kept in use. They are um, basically recycled and reused. Um, natural systems are uh, regenerated. That is also one of the objectives. Um, the loops express uh, the so-called inertia principle. Um, so only repair what is broken, only remanufacture um, that what cannot be repaired anymore and only recycle materials of which the products cannot be remanufactured. Replace or treat only the smallest possible parts in order to maintain the existing economic value. So th this is the underlying principle of the loops that we see so often in the circular economy concepts. Um, so essentially you can see uh, the, um, the biosphere loops and the technosphere loops for the different kinds of material, the natural substances and the uh, physical material substances. So materials serve as a function during their useful life. Um, that's the useful phase. Um, and eventually they reach a non-recoverable state at the point of disposal, that would be the disposal phase. And circular economy transitions, um, they, they will uh, in particular, look at closing loops. Um, figure one shows closing the loop to decrease any leakage and also any negative externalities. But circularity alone is not enough to achieve sustainable development. Um, so the closing the loop means increasing the proportion of materials captured before disposal and uh, being recirculated. But there's also a need to shrink and to slow uh, the material throughput as well, um, as you can see in figure two and three, that's an illustration um, to reflect that. So slowing the loops would be to extend the time material spent in use before being recirculated or disposed. And also shrinking the loops would decrease overall material use regardless of um, the, the end of use for life scenario. Um, here you can see um, uh, the uh, illustration of um, four different circular business models. Um, the circular economy is essentially made up of circular businesses and circular value chains. Um, essential principles uh, would be to source the products and materials from the economy, not from the ecological reserves. 
um, to create value for customers by adding value to existing products and materials and also to create valuable inputs for businesses beyond the customer. Um, examples of circular business models um, or how businesses can actually create value with circularity um, can, yeah, uh, there, there are four different ones. One is either the, the circular design, uh, business models focus on delivering long product life supported by the development and planning phase of products for, for example, for durability or for standardization and compatibility, um, for maintenance and repair, for upgradability and adaptability, as well as for dis and reassembly. So all of these, um, uh, all of these uh, uh, characters are, are important um, for, uh, products to remain um, to remain in in use and also to be repaired to be upgraded um, uh, as long as possible. Um, so these business models often encourage sufficiency with consumers. Um, the solutions actively seek to reduce end user consumption. And um, often this is supported by uh, this fourth business model um, where, where there's a coordination of these circular value chains through platforms, through technology. Um, yeah, essentially adding value. So the second business model is the circular use. Um, it's, it's concentrating on the operational phase of an asset. Um, so it, it aims at keeping control over the asset and retaining its value. Um, and, and it's a, often a product to service model. It's extending the service li life of products and components uh, as long as possible. And then there is the circular recovery model. It's exploiting the residual value of products at the end of the product service um, and or at, at the end of the life of, of or end of use time of, of a product and of a useful life period. Um, and the revenue is generated, for example, by transforming the existing products into new ones, adding value or reducing costs, reducing waste. Um, this could, for example, include the collection and reverse logistics and sorting and reprocessing stages of the supply chain. So, and as I, oh, sorry, as I mentioned before, the coordination of the circular value chains is often done through data and digital platforms, which uh, essentially contributes for uh, that uh, these business models ma make money from providing the platform that brings different actors and so-called prosumers, consumers that become produce producers um, as well together when creating the products and services. And also they essentially provide um, these services to satisfy user needs without needing to own the physical product. Um, I here I illustrate um, one example of the technosphere. This is an interface um, as, as one, one global company, a global company that um, has uh, um, brought up the concept of um, yeah, re repairable flooring. You can see it best in this right hand side or in the lower picture, the colored one. Um, that this at the beginning you would you would have an entire floor, um, yeah, already uh, in different patterns. So if if one piece needs to be repaired, it can be easily repaired by by the flooring in in a different way and using one of the one of the different patterns that have been used. So essentially this um, this company 
um, this flooring company is making use of the inertia principle that uh, you would you would be e like you could easily repair this concept. You don't have to take out the entire carpet if there is maybe a ten, ten square centimeters um, uh, damage on the carpet. Um, also, the company is is uh, has a climate take back mission their objective is to eliminate um, the carbon footprint uh, and they would like to become carbon negative by 2040 essentially they like they they, they in they research and uh, innovate on on different materials and also on their and on their fillers to reduce the carbon footprints of their interiors that they offer. Another example that I would like to bring forward here is uh, from the bioeconomy. Um, really, that um, insects um, can be a great upcycler. Um, for example, here the black soldier fly that is used by the company called Protex, but also different other different companies that uh, and, and also small farmers uh, that have used this uh, insect. Um, one ton of insect can be grown in 14 days and using a land area of only 20 square meters. So that means that they can turn even low grade fruit and vegetable waste into valuable body mass and and like that that is the the larvae of this fly they eat on bio uh, waste and then can be used um, either directly as a fresh feed or um, they can be um, further processed into uh, different products for example into uh, flour or crackers or oil for feed and pet food um, and at the same time the excretes of the insects are um, compost and can be used as fertilizer. Um, so you can see the old scenario um, is that uh, we consume there's food waste the waste collected is being brought most of it is being brought to landfill some of it is composted and used for food production whereas with this black soldier fly you have essentially also uh, an alternative um, yeah sorry that this covers here a little bit, but you have the alternative that with the black soldier fry production with the larvae, in fact, the larvae production, um, there is um, the consumption as a feed for, for, for uh, chicken, for fish, for ducks, uh, can, be, can be used as a protein source, which also in some countries is very scarce. So it's, it's a good, even very decentralized and local production like uh, local um, product that can be can be uh, can be produced on a very decentralized level for even on small fall of small farmers level and then also there's compost um, yes. and as I introduced um, uh, at the beginning uh, also in this context of circular economy promotion and um, the striving for sustainable development uh, steered by governments. Um, increasingly, public authorities discover the strong leverage that they um, that they can have with their own consumption um, to stimulate the markets that they want to see develop. Uh, for example, um, uh, yes, uh, here you can see um, that the government consumption with the procurement specifications on product or an organization or the award criteria, they can actually influence on what they uh, receive, what they are supplied by either through the contractor or directly from the producer. So a governments in their attempt to make sure their integrity as a responsible consumer and to implement the circular public procurement have incorporated measurements in their selection and award mechanisms, for example, labels or certification schemes, as well as they link public procurement results with the measurement of the impact achieved. And um, 
Therefore, if, if businesses in, intend to supply government under such responsible pro procurement scheme, um, it will be helpful to be able to respond to these measurements. And, and part of it uh, can be also circular, uh, circular criteria. So uh, criteria that promotes circular economy. Mm, and um, examples I would like to I would like to show in the next slide. Um, there's a list of um, indicators. You can see um, that they, yeah, this is um, an illustration by Network of Sustainable Business Development, North, Mark, North Denmark. Um, these are like circular public procurement indicators and, and those, those criteria um, can be related to the original and also to retrofitted, re retrofitted products. Uh, for example, the ability to recycle, to disassemble, to identify the individual materials in the product, um, as well as resource efficiency and the total cost of ownership, which is the purchasing price plus the cost of its operation. Then there are also supplier business models, um, which we have seen before, the circular design, circular use, and circular recovery, that those can be um, requested as a, as, as a criteria. And also in like the request to have entire systems, circular systems, for example, sharing or using or renting uh, leasing instead of per procuring product services systems in, instead of just procurement of products and as well as to request um, that there is already a pre predetermined second life of the product, um, either the product that is procured or the product that is leased or rented. So overall, with this trend of circular economy, if the, um, like some, like many of the consumers and then the, including the government as a consumer um, would change um, from, from a procurement, from, a, from someone who buys um, to um, essentially only a user that rents uh, the, or leases services. Um, concrete examples um, for ex can be shared from the city of Ghent uh, in Belgium. It's uh, the second largest municipality um, with an, an annual spend on cleaning products uh, of approximately 17 million US dollars. Um, they, uh, the city um, incorporated, for example, um, several yeah, indicators or specifications into their procurement system that is uh, products are delivered um, using vehicles that those, those vehicles should meet the emission standard Euro 6 or, or better. Um, and then packaging uses 85% recycled cardboard um, plastics bottles uh, should be made from, uh, from a certain material like PhD. Um, sorry. And um, also uh, uh, the supplier is responsible at own expense for taking back all the packaging, for example. So uh, th those are example criteria from the city of Ghent. Or another example is the Danish municipality Lawland, which included um, recycling and recyclability criteria for packaging in their tender for cleaning services. So they say 75% of material used for bags must be recycled or biodegradable, um, or non-reusable -re packaging must be easy to separate into single material types. So those are examples of how criteria in, um, in the context of public procurement can be used to, to encourage a circular economy. Okay, thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion.
Thank you, Corinne. This was an enriching presentation and it really helped to picture the uh, system in my eyes. Thank you very much. I would like to open the floor for discussions and the questions now, please. I see in chat uh, some questions, but perhaps some of the friends would like to speak it out. So I'd like to wait with the chat first. Okay, for the uh, purpose of exhibition, there's a question here. I like it uh, because I know the answer, I think. Uh, the, do climate policies make a country less competitive? Um, I'd like to take the, uh, this question and then I'd like to pass the ball to Karine because I think we believe we can ask this question. Uh, what are the implications of circular economy with the competitiveness of a country? Uh, well, in my side on the uh, economy front, the answer is a clear, big, fat no. Climate policies do not make a country less competitive, in fact, just the opposite. Um, being more climate sensitive and responsible can be profitable also. Um, it, it feels good for sure, um, but um, it doesn't mean that it will make you less uh, competitive. And we believe that in fact, being late to follow the climate policy policies and responsible production policies will trim the uh, investment attractiveness of the countries in the period ahead. So Turkey should be um, aware of uh, this. And uh, I'd like to hear Karin's point of view, of, uh, how circular economy approaches affect the competitiveness of the uh, of a country. Mm, yes, um, I fully agree with you that um, given in particular the international commitments uh, into the direction of, uh, of climate action, it's actually a question of being competitive by having a, a, a climate policy or also in this sense now the circular economy is is an approach that uh, many governments take on really across all continents and um, it will be a question of being competitive to be able to to yeah to to incorporate these uh, these principles these new circularity uh, uh, concepts um, so it's it's the other way around essentially you are more competitive if you go with the transition um, and as you saw from the, it's still an abstract, uh, maybe abstract uh, um, illustration of several business models, but certainly those business models are profitable. Otherwise, th those businesses would not be um, operating. And, uh, and so these, these business models can be identified and also transition, uh, like, Old, older transition, uh, older business models can be also transitioned into more circular. It's maybe not the question of becoming 100% circular uh, uh, next day, but uh, there can be different elements that can be incorporated step by step. And um, certainly, for example, renewable energies can be can be incorporated uh, in in the current business models and and other um, angles of how to become more circular, how to in, include a, a higher um, uh, focus on regeneration of nature um, can be incorporated uh, in a competitive way. We don't hear you, Burcu Hanım. Thank you very much. It's not the first time I speak to myself. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a question from uh, Ayça Hanım. Uh, and she asks, what range of incentives could governments, public and private sectors provide to the most remote, most vulnerable communities in order to put green re recovery in the center of their focus? Um, thank you very much. It's um, enriching to think about it, I would say. Um, I cannot name anything certainly about it now, uh, but there are two things I think I, would, I should underline. One of them is uh, financial uh, inclusion. Uh, 
is uh, something that development banks, um, this includes also World Bank and the IMF um, and development banks such as the TSKB, is something we have been discussing quite long, financial inclusion. We should be more people around the table. It's just difficult to uh, define um, who are you talking about when you are speaking about financial inclusion. There's no one size fits at all uh, definition, I believe. Uh, different countries have different uh, problems and uh, different countries have different push factors for different parts of the society. I think financial inclusion still should top the agenda in the uh, green recovery. And another uh, point is, as I showed you before, some 12 trillion of fiscal stimulus came already to fight the uh, COVID-19 related pandemic. 12 trillion means actually the, the tax, taxes that have been collected all throughout these years, uh, one way or the other. Um, but does it mean that those who paid the tax should be the beneficiary. No, I, I don't really believe in that system because there are so many people who have no surplus, you cannot really tax them. Uh, so when the stimulus packages come from the governments, I think um, we should not think about the equality. I think we should think about equity, equity, eşitlik değil denklik. Something I'd like to um, discuss also um, more uh, comprehensively in my uh, conferences uh, all the time, uh, treating people equally, if those people are not equal, are in, is in fact wrong. So we have to think about equity. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that is defined, uh, this well-defined within the green recovery. As I said, that is also still something we need to point at and insist uh, to demand. Yeah, maybe to add, yeah. um, certainly, uh, for example, in public procurement, there can be also um, criteria that relate to maybe more social criteria or economic criteria, um, for example, uh, uh, to um, support um, the, 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 the procurement from suppliers that are more SMEs or that are uh, from uh, like maybe managed by by women also like criteria can be set in a certain way or so based on the discussion with industry that hopefully takes place prior to um, setting up the selection criteria um, yeah so so um, if if for example SMEs are um, promoted with the um, with the public procurement then also uh, those same SMEs in the same sector can be supported by subsidies or by uh, technical assistance also to be able to transition to uh, uh, higher levels of circularity in the sense of, or, or higher levels of sustainable uh, uh, businesses so, so, th so they can comply with the, with the public procurement criteria which essentially gives them a market so I think this is actually a very um, very good incentive uh, to put forward or another incentive was also I think it's you could call it a subsidy uh, for ecosystem uh, uh, services so payment for ecosystem services um, to uh, informal waste pickers so informal waste pickers would not only get um, a price for the for the product that they that they provide to essentially to the recycling industry. But in addition, um, that is a, an example from Brazil, it's currently piloted. Uh, in addition, there is a payment for the ecosystem service of these, uh, of this essentially a service provider of this informal waste picker that keeps the environment clean. And, and so there's an additional amount paid to them. Um, to yeah to ensure that the service is being continued and even um, improved i think those are two examples thank you very much corinne um i'd like to take if there is one last question or else i'd like to inform you about a picture uh, tradition of the uh, uncom plus series is there any question no uh i think Okay, there is one uh, from Gönül Hanım. Uh, to understand correctly, recycling is an outdated form of being sustainable. 
now it's time to be economically circular in order to take part our to be competitive. So should we replace, reuse, redistribute, remanufacture with recycling? I think Reen might answer. Uh, yes, uh, like recycling is maybe not outdated, but it is not the first solution to go to. Ideally, I mean, we, we need to be realistic as well where we start from currently when we look at, um, at our material flow, uh, even recycling rate is still low uh, across the world. Uh, we think we're at 9% at or so on average. Um, uh, some regions be perform better than others, but uh, but certainly yes. The, in the concept of the circular economy, the idea is to um, to shift from this view of just closing the loop to also keeping the loops as close as possible, like as as narrow as possible, and and that means really try and have a higher durability going go back into quality of products uh, also timelessness of design and simplicity of design so all uh, product related design related aspects come up as for for easier repair and also to support repair over over recycling as long as it can be repaired uh, and remanufactured uh, this would be the, the the preferred solution it's not possible for all products and materials but it's the vision of uh, like following this the closer loops as much as possible and eventually redesign materials and products so they can uh, be uh, increasingly repaired and and kept on a high level at all times instead of having to be recycled uh, um, all the time or being even brought to landfills or uh, incinerators. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Damla Hanım. Uh, also, well, it's time for taking a picture, I guess. Uh, as far as I'm informed, and uh, if I'm not correct, uh, Bengi Hanım might correct me. We're going to all say a bit cheese and hands up and waving hands and there will be a picture taking uh, is it the time now yes <laughs> say cheese and peace <laughs> okay thanks for your time thank you thank you